I've been working on this for 23 years, and it's been kind of my passion since even before that. Uh, what I'll do today is try to explain so you understand that this picture here, which is probably a picture that people at least saw flash by them at some time in the last year since this discovery got so much publicity. What the picture is, and I'll later uh, try to let you understand it, is two detectors, which I'll show you why. Uh, each detector detecting essentially the same thing. When you look and see these are the traces that we get, essentially unedited. They haven't been uh, gone through any computer editing at all. They're basically what we see online. And the bottom one is superposing one on top of the other, sliding it by seven milliseconds. Uh, and then they fit on top of each other. And the little line that goes through the curves that you might be able to see, but I'll show this better later, is the prediction if from general relativity of Einstein, if the two, op if, it's, if these, these traces are due to the merger of a binary system of two black holes. So my goal is to kind of deconstruct this picture for you uh, so that you understand it. I'm not going to go through all the history since Einstein. I'm going to try to concentrate on what it took to measure this and what it is. So uh, Einstein in 1915 presented for the first time a new theory of gravity. This is 250 years after Newton. Uh, there was little reason to think that Newton was wrong at that time. Uh, Newton's theory of gravity, although it was simple-minded, explained everything from the tides to the uh, uh, planets going around the sun, uh, except with one flaw, and that was the, the period, the orbit of Mercury around the sun. Mercury has a very elliptical orbit around the sun, and the orbit around the sun uh, was slightly different by about 10% from the predictions of Newton. That was the only thing in 250 years that was, let's say, a puzzle that maybe could motivate Einstein to do a new theory. However, even that wasn't much of a problem because there were ideas and even searches for some body that we hadn't seen yet between Mercury and the Sun that would alter the, the orbit by enough to, to compensate that. And that was a big thing that was done in the 19th century. And even after Einstein, NASA did searches for objects between. But Einstein introduced the theory of, uh, new theory of gravity. Uh, it was very complex, as you can see by these equations. It has to do with things that are hard for all of us to visualize. That's a, a merger, uh, a, a unification of, of uh, space and time. Uh, not many physicists, let alone the public, understood it at the time. It did solve the problem of Mercury. And it made one other prediction. That was the prediction of how much light would bend because it goes near, since it's, since it's got to do with space and time, uh, the theory of general relativity warps space around a massive object. And if light goes by it or a particle goes by it, it gets distorted. And so uh, Einstein predicted that if uh, uh, an object let's say stars went behind the sun and you viewed them, you could see the light curve around the sun. That was detected and measured in about 1920. And uh, that basically made people believe the theory and made Einstein a household name uh, in 1920. It still was a very hard concept and still is today. And in fact, if you put it in Microsoft Word, it makes a little wavy, wavy line under the word space time, meaning that even the spell check in Microsoft Word doesn't believe that it's a single word. But it is. Actually, it's much more common than you think. And I think all of us experience general relativity. And I'll show you that in the next slide. And then I'll go on to, to uh, uh, gravitational waves. All of us, essentially all of us, now use GPS to tell us how to drive down a road or how to hike if we don't drive and where to go with amazing accuracy and we stay on the road. But did you know that you need general relativity to make it work? I'll show you how much the, re the reason why. The satellites are 
about moving at about 24,000 miles per hour or 40,000 kilometers an hour and when they're going around. There's about six satellites that are seen <coughs> by the car or you when you're uh, doing it. An object that's going at 24,000 miles an hour has a finite, uh, is a finite fraction of the velocity of light. So uh, all of us have learned at some point in freshman physics that relativity tells us that moving clocks tick more slowly. And in fact, that's true of the satellites. They're going fast enough so that in the satellite, you have to make a correction. And that correction is made in the satellite itself from the data, and that's seven uh, microseconds a day. But there's a second correction, and that's for general relativity. Just the fact that, that the satellites are experiencing only about a quarter of the gravity on the surface of the Earth means that there's a correction from general relativity, and it's even larger and has the opposite sign. It basically makes clocks go faster because there's less gravitational, gravitational field, and that's a correction of about 45 microseconds per day. So if we put those together, we get a correction of 38 microseconds per day. You never see any of this because it's done in the satellites. But how important is that? If we look at the accuracy we need to stay on the road, uh, it's about, if we want to stay in, say, 10 meter space, a pretty wide road, uh, then that requires 30 nanoseconds accuracy. So if we move by 38 microseconds per day, it means that you would r roll off the road within a couple of minutes. So all of us should realize that general relativity is part of our everyday life. Anyway, the third prediction that Einstein made, he didn't make in 1915, but the following year, and that was the prediction of gravitational waves. He made that based on s noticing that the equations that he, depending on how he set up general relativity, the equations looked a lot like the equations you have in electricity and magnetism for electrodynamics, making electromagnetic waves. And using that analogy, he made a prediction in 1916, one year after uh, he uh, pr brought out general relativity, that there would be gravitational waves connected with uh, general relativity. And he published a paper in 1916 saying that. That paper had errors, the most serious being a factor of two. And uh, he uh, basically wrote a second paper in 1918 correcting the factor of two error and also uh, doing something else that was important. He included in the second paper how you make gravitational waves, the source being a quadrupole source. And we, if we make electromagnetic waves, we take uh, charges and oscillate them, a binary system. And for electromagnetic, for gravitational waves, it's got to be a quadrupole system. So he said that. And that should be the end of the story. And in fact, in the paper that where we show the first uh, discovery of gravitational waves, we wrote it as one sentence. That we, the very first sentence of the paper said in 1916, Einstein predicted general relativity. And in and, uh, and 1915 and 1916, uh, gravitational waves. And that Sch uh, Schwarzschild predicted black holes the same year and that we detected them 100 years later. The story is not quite as simple as that, although that's what we wrote in the paper. Einstein made a mistake, as I say, fixed it two years later. It actually is much more complicated than that. It has a very sordid history. Einstein himself didn't uh, believe gravitational waves for a while, even in the 1930s. In the 1930s, he wrote a paper, which luckily never was published which was entitled, Do Gravitational Waves Exist? And by the time the paper was published, he changed the title. And it was published because it was originally reviewed for physical review. He published it in a different journal, journal because they questioned the paper. Uh, and eventually, he published it uh, as a more a rigorous uh, way to look at gravitational waves. But he doubted it. It was doubted by a lot of people, theory, people in the theory community. And the problem traces back to the fact that there are, are coordinate singularities when you try to put together a consistent way of space and time all together to cover all of space time. And those can get confused with whether or not there's some effect in space time like gravitational waves. So it wasn't, it wasn't until the 1950s uh, 
when uh, there was a meeting in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where the prominent theorists in this general area uh, got together, where theorists in general no longer doubted, but after that meeting agreed that gravitational waves exist. Uh, that didn't mean they could be detected. Uh, Einstein never thought they could be detected, but he didn't understand what modern technology would allow us to do by now. Uh, and so, uh, basically, uh, we have then turned it into an experimental problem roughly 60 years ago. So for the last 60 years, the problem has been not whether gravitational waves exist theoretically, that was the first 40 years, but in the last 60 years, can we detect them? And uh, we did, and I'm gonna go back to show you how, from this object here. What, what's being shown in this picture is basically a computer rendition of the curves that I showed you on the first slide. It's not an animation. I'm gonna show you the moving of it, but I wanna explain it first. So this is a binary system, two black holes. They're gonna be going around each other. A black hole is a region of space where the gravity is so strong that nothing can get out. That happens when a star that's much heavier than our sun collapses into a small enough space so that gravity uh, is so strong that it makes a black hole. The ones we saw happened 1.3 billion years ago, and the signal just came to Earth. Just to put that in reference, 1.3 billion years ago on Earth, we were just evolving from single cell to multi-cell life. So that's where we were. To get, put this in a practical sense, let's look at a map of Scandinavia. And the little uh, notation is at Stockholm. Uh, these two objects are basically uh, in Helsinki and Oslo, are that far away from each other, that's all. Each one of them is about the size that I show here, weighing 35 times the mass of our sun. That means 10, uh, thir 10 million times heavier than the Earth itself put into this small space. And they're going around each other, I slow it down in the animation, up, at up to half the speed of light. So it's almost unbelievable to try to conceive of what's happening. But this is the rendition from the equations that fit the curve. So going, they're going around each other now, and as they go around each other, they emit gravitational radiation. As they emit energy, they coalesce toward each other. They eventually come together, as we'll see in a second. And as they come together at the very last thing, which we'll look at, you'll see it kind of ring a little bit. Now it's ringing. And I'll explain that whole thing from the beginning to the merger, to the ring down. And that's kind of the signature that we look at and what we saw. And of course, this final black hole is bigger than the other two. It's about 60 times the mass of our sun. Okay. I'm gonna write down just a couple of equations because they're very familiar. If you write down for general relativity, you can write general relativity in many ways, but I've chosen to write it in a way that makes it look similar to what we know about electromagnetism, because I want to try to show you what gravitational waves are. So if I, I pick what's called a Minkowski metric and uh, 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 pick my gauge in a certain way, I get an equation which looks in form familiar with what we know from electromagnetism. In this case, we have this little h mu nu. It turns out to be what's called in general relativity the strain but what, when I show you experiment, is exactly what we measure. So we measure what we call the strain. It's the amplitude of the gravitational wave. When we have something of this form, if I look at it in the right way, I get basically a traveling uh, uh, waves, plane waves. So this is a basically uh, a very simple-minded way of showing that you get two waves traveling just like we learned in electromagnetism. But if you notice the little picture of the gravitational waves, they're not at, in electromagnetism, we have two components of electromagnetic waves, 90 degrees from each other, and they propagate through space. Here, they actually are at 45 degrees from each other. And the reason they're 45 degrees from each other is that gravity in quantum mechanically is spin two. 
It's interesting then, in our experiment, we don't, don't do it yet, but we can actually decompose in the future these two components of gravitational waves. And our experiment is fundamentally a classical physics experiment, but we're able to determine or prove something quantum mechanically, that is that gravity is spin two. We haven't done that yet, but that uh, comes out of what we'll do. So let's go a step further. This is the picture then of these two black holes coming together. If I put in the numbers that I showed you on the first slide, just the numbers we're gonna have, and I'll show you how we extract those numbers in a while. But if I pick those two numbers, then we notice that the uh, black holes were about 30 solar masses. They're about 100 kilometers in size. The frequency of that first picture that I showed you, and I'll show you where we see that a little bit better in the data, is about 100 hertz. And the distance, which I'll show you later how we get, is about 500 megaparsecs away, which is about 1.3 billion light years. What I said before was when it happened 1.3 billion light years ago. The complicated formula that I'll show next, you can forget, but that's just how you then calculate with general relativity the strength of that signal. The strength of that signal is the little thing, the little h that I talked about, and it's a very small number. It's 10 to the minus 21. That number is proportional to exactly what I'll show you we measure in the experiment, a change of length over length. So most of this talk is gonna to try to, to show you how we measure something that changes length by one part in 10 to the 21. That's the challenge that we've had, and that's what's taken 60 years uh, to develop. So let's look at it a little bit now from uh, what I've said. First, gravitational waves are ripples in space-time. In other words, it makes something like a plane wave, as I said. And I'm in an analogy to electromagnetism, but keep in mind that in electromagnetism, there's photons, there's matter that propagates when an electromagnetic wave propagates. In this case, there is no matter, there's no thing that propagates with it, at least in the classical theory of Einstein. And instead, it's just a, a wave going through space. Simple analogy to that is throwing a pebble in a pond, which makes little ripples that pass through, but there's no material in the ripples, for example. So it's basically a passage of a distortion of space-time propagating out in space-time. Okay. The size or amplitude of the wave that we have to measure and have measured and was kind of our goal, as I'll show you why, uh, is one part in 10 to the 21. So we want to measure an effect that changes the, where the surface of water, if it was water, or changes this, the, whatever we're measuring by one part in 10 to the 21. We do that by measuring a change of distance, and that little h, which is 10 to the minus 21, if we multiply it by some distance, is the change of length that we'll measure. Therefore, to make delta L, which is what we'll measure as big as possible, we make L very big. And so that's the underlying reason why LIGO, when I show it to you, is very big. It's kilometers long. So think now of a gravitational wave propagating through space and entering the board here. And if I have a, a ring, circular ring, of radius L, and these are free masses, and then a gravitational wave comes into the board, what does it do? It basically distorts the, the circle in one direction, it increases the length, and in the other direction, it squashes it. And that change is the same delta L. So that's the delta L that we want to measure. And if I just repeat down here what I've shown you then, we're going to measure this delta L. It's little h, which is the physics thing, the strain times L. It's of order 10 to the minus 21. And if I multiply it times a meter, I get 10 to the minus 21. But if I take a large detector like LIGO, which is a kilometer, several kilometers, then this becomes a number that we have to measure that's about 10 to the minus 18. And 10 to the minus 18 meters is a very small number. So let me emphasize how small that is first. We all know what a meter is. A meter stick is so long. We also know that a human hair, we can see it, and it's uh, about 100 microns in size, 
are a factor of 10,000 times smaller than a meter stick. Still smaller, we know the wavelength of light of this laser light uh, in the laser is about one micron, uh, here, I'm sorry, is 100 microns, and that's a factor of 100 smaller, and of course we can't see that wavelength. So it's lower than our eyes can see. Then we have to get to atomic and nuclear sizes. An atomic diameter, then, is 10 to the minus 10 meters, and that's 10,000 times smaller than the uh, wavelength of light. And a nuclear size, a proton, is 10 to the minus 15 meters, or 100,000 times smaller than the size of an atomic diameter. And we want to measure something that's 1,000 times smaller than that, 10 to the minus 18 meters. That may sound impossible and you want to go home now, but actually the way we do it is the same trick that you use to know that you get heads half the time and tails half the time when you flip a coin. You make the measurement so many times that you can do it very, very accurately. In our case, we have lots and lots of photons, each of which helps us make this measurement. So if we have enough photons, we can make them in a simple-minded way to say we can make the measurement many, many times and do it very accurately. So that's the idea. I'll show you a little bit more technically what it means. So this is a picture of physically what's presumably happening if we have the merger of two objects, compact objects, going around each other emitting gravitational radiation. They, they basically uh, get closer together, they radiate more as they get closer together, and their frequency gets higher. So this is the so-called chirp signal. It comes up and up and faster and faster, and then it enters this region where they're merging together. F for the future, that's the most interesting region. That's the region of what we call strong gravity. Now, as I said in the beginning, we know that general relativity is right. We use it every day. But we really don't know it's right in the region where it's most interesting and important, and that is the region where there's strong gravitational fields, like in the merger of black holes. So this is our laboratory for the future to really understand the guts of strong, of strong field gravity, and it's probably the best place it'll ever be done. So that's what we do in the middle. And at the end, it has to basically get rid of its quantum effects and spin and everything else, and there's a ring down at the very end. So this is the characteristic signature. Over here, I show that uh, how that signal looks depends on how heavy the objects are. In our detector, if the objects are lighter, and I'm going to show you this in real events, it, it, it oscillates many times and goes to a much higher frequency if they're very heavy, uh, just a few times. And I'll show you that in our event. We have different kinds of possible sources. Black holes are heavy, and that's what we saw. Uh, but there's also the possibility of, for example, studying binary neutron star systems. And I have to admit that most of us that have been doing this have expected that that would be the first source that we would detect. And that's because we, we know something about how many, by a little bit about how many binary neutron star systems there are because we see them in our galaxy, neutron stars, and we've seen binary ones in our galaxy. And in fact, a binary neutron star system was used to indirectly show that gravitational waves exist. Uh, 30 years ago or 25 years ago by Hulson Taylor. So we expect to study neutron star systems. Interestingly, a binary neutron star system, if it comes together, I'm not going to talk about it, so I'll just say now, is very different physics. It's really nuclear physics. We can try to understand the equation of state of this complicated mixture of nuclear matter in a neutron star. and. Uh, and it's, we think, maybe the best way to get some understanding of neutron stars in the internal equation of state. And then there can be neutron star binary uh, black hole systems or systems that have three objects. So this has got a lot of future, but we've just started. So how does this relate to an experiment? How are we going to get at this? And we've chosen a particular method, which is called interferometry, so suspended mass interferometry. This picture here, then, is imagine is space being distorted uh, in the two directions as a function of time. I've put a frequency on this of, uh, once every couple seconds or one, a couple times a second. So it's, 
basically low frequency. We're going to be working at somewhat higher frequencies when I show you, but for the picture I do that. And then if I superpose what we call a, an interferometer on top of it, it's a perfect match for what we have to do. We all know that in, in terms of precision work, it's often very difficult to measure something absolutely. How heavy a kilogram is or how big a meter is. That, that's a very difficult thing. We have standards and systems that try to do that very accurately. But we often can measure the difference between things that are very close together if we measure the difference much more accurately. Luckily, that's what an interferometer does. And that's exactly what we're trying to measure here. Because what happens is that we distort things, making it longer in this direction when it's shorter in this direction. And normally, an interferometer sends light to an object here, to a splitting beam. The, the light goes off in two directions and comes back at the same time. And you set it so they cancel each other, and a sensor sees nothing. The light just cancels each other. But when one of the arms gets a little longer than the other, or shorter, it takes a different amount of time to go down one arm than the other arm. Once they're out of phase with each other, then we see light in this detector. We see the light happen at the frequency of this wave, and that's basically, in a very general sense, the idea. I'll show it to you in a little more complicated sense of what, how that gets employed. So the match between using interferometry and using um, and trying to measure the difference is what gives us the key, plus the fact that we have modern instrumentation where we can get lots of photons well collimated from lasers and, and uh, other tricks that we use. So the next thing is us. So we now uh, propose to build a, a, an interferometer. And as I said, the reason to make it very long is that then we only have to measure 10 to the minus 18 meters instead of 10 to the minus 21 if it was on a tabletop. And we propose to build two of these. Uh, one, and this is a collaboration at that time between Caltech and MIT. Uh, we picked a site in Southern California near Edwards Air Force Base. MIT picked a site in Southern Maine. We couldn't choose the sites for the US government, but we basically put them in as what we call sample sites in the proposal. Uh, the government came back rotating it by 45 degrees. And we have a powerful senator in Louisiana named Bennett Johnson, who was a big advocate and one in, Louis in Washington. So we didn't get them near our home bases, but we uh, got the political support we needed. The thing to look at on here, though, is the separation between these two. It's 3,000 kilometers. So we built, we're going to build two identical interferometers. They're separated by 3,000 kilometers. This was approved uh, for funding in 1994. I, I became uh, director of LIGO a year, before, a year before that, or six months before that. We had an immediate decision to make then once it was approved. And I'll give you that in 10 seconds or so. And that is, how do you align these two interferometers? So now we're going to put an interferometer in Washington, an interferometer in Louisiana. How do we align them relative to each other? If we aligned the two interferometers at 45 degrees from each other, then we could take a gravitational wave signal, if we found one, and take the difference in what we see in the two and unravel the two components of the gravitational wave polarization that I described. If we put the two interferometers <laughs> parallel to each other, then instead, we should see within the accuracy of a 16 degree curvature of the Earth between these two, uh, to the extent that they're parallel to each other, then we'd see identical signals in the two. You can tell from the very first slide that I showed that we picked to make them parallel to each other. And I'm glad 20 some years later that we did that because basically the confidence that we saw what we saw is partially that we can take one signal that we saw in Louisiana and put it on top of the one that we see in Washington. What we did is give up a little bit of science, maybe not a little bit, but the science of polarization, in order to have the confidence of the detection, knowing that as this field develops, once we detect them, we will have much information about polarization. The third detector, which is not quite working as well as ours yet, is, in, is being done by a French and Italian collaboration in Italy and the data that I'll show you on how well we found this first event would have been much better if we had them involved in terms of position 
have been able to triangulate and also in terms of being able to uh, determine the polarization. So in the future, polarization will be known for gravitational wave events. So that was the first decision. This is, this is the, uh, then the two uh, interferometers. They're on very different geological sites. One is in the state of Washington, in uh, uh, eastern Washington. If you've ever been in there, that's very high desert, um, basically um, flat, very high desert, mountains in the background. It doesn't rain very much. And uh, we had to dig very deep to get water to even do the construction. The second one is in Louisiana. This is pine, commercial pine forest. And we, be, we got a little bit of land to make the two arms in the middle of this commercial uh, pine forest. And there, it's basically Louisiana swamps. If you look here, this is actually water. And what it is is it rains, and there's so much flooding in Louisiana that we built the interferometer up about five meters above the ground level. We did that by borrowing dirt from here and making it higher. As soon as we did that, the, that filled with water by itself. We didn't do anything. Fish, bugs, even alligators. So basically, we have a water on the side. But the, despite that, I'm going to show you a graph in a few minutes of the sensitivity. And these two very different geologies don't affect anything. The two instruments are made to work the same. We keep them identical by changing. If we change electronics in one, we change it in the other one at the same time or the next day. And you'll see that the performance is right on top of each other for the data that we have. This is the next picture. And this picture was taken in 1997 or 98. It's the guts of LIGO, or the middle of LIGO. And it has built into it a certain strategy that, uh, that we adopted. And that strategy is, this looks very, is by the complexity of the picture, you can kind of tell, but I'll tell you what it is. And that is, when I made the picture of a little laser beam and an interferometer, why should it have these huge things and ports and uh, lots of other stuff? The reason main reason was to try to build, from the beginning, a flexible infrastructure that could be evolved as we learned how to make an interferometer that would be sensitive enough to detect gravitational waves. What you have to keep in mind is that in 1994, we didn't have the technology that I'll show you that we needed and have now in 2016 uh, in order to make the detection. And I'll show you what that took and where we developed it and how. But so along here, we have these are the ports, these are the chambers that hold the various optics that we have. All the, the access ports and so forth allow us to put in different, to get access, to change what's inside. Uh, these, this here is a big gate valve so that we don't have to bring the vacuum up to air when we work on the, on the chambers themselves and the, and the uh, mirrors which sit in here. And this is very big because we have to isolate everything from the ground. I didn't explain why things are suspended, but they're suspended because we're trying to measure the difference between those free balls that I showed and not stretching of the Earth, because once we get mixed up with the Earth, it's a different problem. OK, so I make this interferometer. It's in this complex thing. What limits it? What is it that limits it? A lot of things, unfortunately. So the first thing is just residual gas. So we made long arms in order to get good sensitivity. But when we made long arms to get good sensitivity, then we have a lot of molecules that are between us and the mirror at the far end. And so we need to get, have good vacuum. So what you saw at the end of the last picture is we have vacuum chambers that are 1.2 meters in diameter and are 4 kilometers long, four of them. That's 16 kilometers at 10 to the minus 9 tor. So this is the biggest high vacuum system in the world. We need that to keep from there being residual gas scattering. Why? Because if a photon comes down and scatters off the gas, any a molecule in the gas, it can then find a path scattering, say, off the walls of the chamber so that it has a longer path by the time it comes back, would look out of phase. So we have to keep that down. First background. Second one is the laser itself. This laser is really great that I'm holding in my hand. But it's nowhere near the kind of laser that we need to run LIGO. We need a very powerful laser at a particular wavelength that we can use uh, 
to reflect and know what we're doing. And it has to be stabilized, very stabilized, in wavelength, in amplitude, and in direction. And so we have a whole system, which I'll show you in a photograph, of a laser that's well beyond what exists in most commercial lasers that you use, uh, that gives us the light we need. The most important for the measurement that I'm going to show you is this one. That is the seismic noise. That is the fact that we suspend these masses, they still have to somehow connect to the Earth. They're not floating. And we therefore have some problem, limiting problem of how well we can isolate ourselves from just the shaking of the Earth. I'll show you how that works. And the next one is the fact that we work at room temperature. And so our mirrors that we're using in an interferometer have movement of what we call KT noise, which is just the atoms moving around in the mirror itself. And that uh, uh, keeps, that also is a limiting thing. And I'll show you where that is graphically. So what we get, and then the next one is just to show you that life can become more complicated, but we're ready for it in the future. Eventually, we can get so many photons in here that we have some uncertainty. We get a lot of photons, so we get good statistics. That's good. But if we have enough photons, we put pressure on the mirrors and move them so that we get what we call basically a quantum effect. We have to balance those. There's a way around that, which I'll just say the words. I'm not going to show it today, using what we call squeezed light. And so we can try to make the light in a certain way more sophisticated as we improve LIGO in the future uh, to do even better. OK, so this is what we get. So first, keep in mind that we're working on the Earth. Working on the Earth, uh, we end up in basically the same frequency range as our ears. That's not an accident, even though we're not talking about audio signals here at all. The ears have evolved for us to communicate in a way that we pick the place where basically we can quietly communicate on the Earth. So our ears cut off at very low frequencies. Why? Because the Earth makes too much noise at low frequencies. It's shaking like crazy. So our ears don't go to lower than tens of hertz, basically. And the, that shaking falls at a, as a very high power. It falls as frequency to the fourth power. So that's this line here. Some of the things that I showed you before, like residual gas are down here. If we have high, better ga uh, vacuum, it can be lower. The thermal noise that I showed you comes in here. And at high frequencies, we're cut off again for the same reason as the ears. The ears cut off at high frequency because we have to sample quicker and quicker and quicker. And eventually, there's not enough signal to sample. And so our ability gets worse and worse and worse. For an interferometer experts, that's, this is called shot noise. For um, somebody that came from particle physics like myself, it's basically photostatistics. It's how many photons you have. So you have, as you sample faster and faster, you have less photons here than here. And it goes up. The shaded region is then the region of sensitivity. The bottom line is the frequency that we cover. And as I say, it's the audio frequency, even though we're not doing audio. We cover from tens of hertz to thousands of hertz. And this line over here is the sensitivity, where this line right here is 10 to the minus 21, 10 to the minus 22. So if I have a signal that's a strength of what I showed you at the beginning, 10 to the minus 21, and I have a curve that looks like this, then in this region in here, my detector is more sensitive than the signal, and I can hopefully pull out the signal. So that's the idea. The real device, this is what that frequency curve looks like. Ignore all the colors below. Those are our uh, <clears throat> decomposition of what created all the noise. But you see the same shape. This is frequency this way, sensitivity this way. More sensitive is going down. This is seismic noise coming down, just like I showed you. This is shot noise or photostatistics, and this is thermal noise. These are the components that make that all up. And the only new thing that you see here is a bunch of lines. Those lines, so it looks just like we said. We can calculate what it is when we get that. The lines are resonances that you have in any experimental system, electrical resonances or mechanical resonances. We, most of them, we've identified and know even what caused them, but they're basically stable. They cover about 1% of the total uh, uh, graph that I have here. And we just notch them out so they don't exist in the final data at all. So 1% of the frequency range disappears 
But for you, you see them, we don't have a good way of drawing them without them showing up in this ugly way. Okay, so we built an initial version of LIGO. I'll show you a little bit about that technology to show you how we went to advance LIGO. And, and this is that same curve. The best sensitivity we ever got is the, the light one, is the top one. And the red is adding the very first features of what's in advanced LIGO. So concentrate on this one. And that basically, there's a little line that goes near it. That was our design line. So that was the end of, oh, 10 years of running uh, initial LIGO. We then had, we satisfied what we designed, but we didn't see any gravitational waves. And then we made a goal, and that goal was to improve this by a factor of roughly 10. And we had an R&D program in the early 2000 to 2004, so where we developed the technologies that we're using in this. The idea was to, for example, increase the light power, a factor of 10. Let me point out that I, taught, I mentioned in the beginning that what we measure is a strain or an amplitude, not a power. And because of that, if we get a factor of 10 increase in, in sensitivity, that tells us that we look a factor of 10 further out into the universe. And it increases our sensitivity, our data rate, that cube, because the volume goes up as the cube. So a factor of 10 increase is a completely new domain compared to what we had looked at for 10 years. The second increase then is to get a better masses and suspension system, again a factor of 10, and better seismic isolation. Let me quickly show you the technology. This is the pictures of the mirrors themselves. They're 40 kilogram mirrors, very the optically uh, as good of mirrors as you can make that we make, made with 20 layers of a dielectric on the coating on the surface in order to reflect the wavelength of the laser light that we use, which is in the infrared, 1064 nanometers. And for us, if I look at the mirror, it's just a beautiful piece of clear glass because we don't see 1064 nanometers. But for the laser light, it, bound, it reflects at 1094 nanometers. This is the original suspension system. So when we built initial LIGO, ran for 10 years, this is what it looked like. Uh, we basically hung the masses from wires, then they're isolated to first order from the ground. They're free. These are pendulum then, so they swing back and forth a little bit. But the pendulum frequency is one or two hertz. It's low frequency, so it's not in the frequency range that bothers us as long as we control that. So at our frequencies, pendulum doesn't matter. The wires were a piano wire, and in order to keep this from swinging too much, we basically have magnets and actuators that cover it. I'll show you how that evolves into what we did for advanced LIGO. So for advanced LIGO, we were limited in this case by the fact that we had electronics on the mass itself, that we had wires that were just uh, a piano wire and so forth. And we made and developed over a period of time a quadruple pendulum so that the test mass is now the lowest one and the upper ones are used to control the low one. No electronics on the bottom anymore. As you can imagine, it's very tricky to control the bottom one very accurately with the ones on top, but that's what we learned how to do. So this is the picture of what was done for the suspensions to, imp to improve those middle frequencies. The low frequencies, which is the one part you should look at hard because this would enable this measurement, are shown here for initial LIGO. This is the isolation from the ground. It was done just like your cars. Your cars have a shock absorber in it. When it has a shock absorber, you hit a bump. That's at high frequency. It takes it and moves it to a lower frequency by the, by the action of the shock absorbers. We made some very fancy shock absorbers, springs that have constrained layer damping in them. And we had several layers, so it's a little better than your car, but basically as well as we could do in a system that is as clever as your car, basically, maybe the engineering a little bit better. That was the system through 10 years of initial LIGO. This is the system now, and this is the key to our ability to get sensitive enough to do uh, advanced light, to do the measurement that I showed you. What we did is start working as we built initial LIGO on an idea to 
actually extend something that you all, many of you have used, that is the idea of, that's used in these Bose uh, earphones that you use on an airplane in order to get rid of ambient background. The difference in our case is that we have to do that very accurately. So we, as we use uh, passive isolation, which is shown out here, we also use active isolation, but we had to develop active isolation very accurately and in six dimensions. As we have to tell the direction the noise is coming from to correct it properly, the six dimensions are the three linear dimensions and the rotations. And so <clears throat> we developed this over a period of time. Again, four la three layers of this damping. Uh, and this is the system now that does it. And that made an improvement, which I'll show you in a minute, which enabled the measurement. This is just so you see it, a picture of the laser that we use to show you that it's got a little more in it than this one. This is then the improvement that we got. So we finished building Advanced LIGO two years ago. We spent about a half a year making it work and we came down from, this is the curve I showed you before. We came down from this curve to these two curves here. This is what I promised a blue and red curve as Hanford and Louisiana interferometers. They look essentially identical. You can they sit on top of each other, uh, meaning we keep them the same, which is good. And what you see here then is that we increased, we, this is our goal, the factor of 10. We've increased or improved the sensitivity about a factor of three, but the effect on our ability to search is three cubed. And so that's a factor of 27. So it doesn't take long to do better than what we did in five or 10 years of running. So we decided this is the point when we would start running, which began last September. So that's the factor of three. But notice that at low frequencies, the improvement is actually a factor of 100. That's putting in the active seismic isolation. Putting in the active seismic isolation, then we get a factor of 100. That means we're a million times better than what we did before. And it answers anyone's question of why we saw these now when we looked 10 years before. It was impossible in the old detector. Okay, so we put those together, and then one year ago, well now it's a year and a half ago, we saw coming up through the su southern hemisphere, I'll tell you how we know where it was coming from in a minute, uh, a signal, and about 20 milliseconds later, it was seen in Livingston, Louisiana. This is the same picture that I showed you on the first slide, and then seven milliseconds later, we saw it in Hanford, Washington. Okay, our understanding of that now is shown here. This is the, the oscillations getting faster, higher frequency as it comes together, the merger part here, and then the ring down. Those are the three characteristic pieces. The uh, distance that these are apart is shown here in a unit which we call Schwarzschild radii, but you can think of it as something less than 100 kilometers. So it starts a few hundred kilometers apart and comes down to where they merge. And this is the velocity, that's this curve here, starting when we first detect it up here at about three-tenths the speed of light. And by the time they come together in here, they're going at more, more like six-tenths the speed of light. So that's what's detected. Let me show one more graph and then I'll show you the, uh, this and then we'll show you the, uh, what, what the interpretation is of what we've seen. So we've run, we ran for four months, starting in September of last, of the year before last. I ran until January a year ago. And we detected three possible events. Two we call events, and one that we call a candidate, and I'll show you why. This is a picture of those crossing the sensitivity curve. So the first one, which is the one that I showed on the very first slide, is shown here. It's the biggest signal, so it's the biggest signal here, but it cuts off the earliest. That's this picture here of the coming together. The second one, which we declare an event, is in there a long, long time and comes down, but it's over our sensitivity by this much. And it's shown down here. And the third one is this one here. And it isn't quite good enough statistically for us to declare an event, but I'll show you its characteristics. So we have two and a half events, depending on what you want to count. To emphasize, that the reason we can detect these at all is the low frequency. I show you the frequency versus the time. The first event stayed in our apparatus for about a tenth of a second. The second one for almost a second. 
And if I show the frequency at low frequencies where we gained, you can see that most of this signal that we detected is in the 40 to 50 hertz range. And again, on the bottom one, the whole signal is in the 40 to 50, 60 hertz, hertz range. So it's that improvement that enabled the measurement. OK, let me show you just in the last couple minutes then what these are, or what we know about them. We can take that waveform. I'm not going to show you the mathematics in detail and fit the curvature, the curves of the, of the waveform, and pull out the main parameters. So the main parameters in this case are two objects, about 30 solar masses, making a final object that would, if we add the two, would add up to 65 solar masses. But the final object, as we measure it, is 62 solar masses. So three solar masses of energy were radiated in the form of gravitational radiation in about a tenth of a second, the brightest object in the sky at that point. Uh, they're about 1.3 billion light years away, or 400 uh, megaparsecs, and they're spinning, and I can show you that. So the final object we also measure has a spin, uh, which is important as we start understanding the physics of these. They come together, they're spinning objects. The final black hole has a spin it's two-thirds of the maximum that a black hole can be spinning. And this is the, how accurately we determine the mass. So if I put them together then, I can take and analyze all the pieces of this, and I'll show you just a little bit of what we learned. This is again the velocity. So this is the very long one, the second event. If we put the three of them together, then we can see some trends already. And that is these contours here, the inner contour, is the 60% uh, confidence in the top one, the 90% confidence level. Uh, and this is the spin on this axis. So all three of them have not maximum spin, but significant spin for the final black hole. This is the masses. They're all heavy, varying from 20 to 60 solar masses. And the distance away is about 500 megaparsecs for the two we call events. And the one that we're not calling an event, and the reason it's weaker is that it's about twice as far away. So the signal is about half as big. And that's, uh, that's where it is. I just want to show you a little bit of science. So as I promised, we should be able to take these events and try to test general relativity, as it's never been tested before in the strong field limit. What I show here is the parameters, which I won't explain to you, in the way general relativity can be written down, and ask whether any of those can be moved and violate uh, basically the calculations of general relativity itself, any hint that general relativity is being violated on a single event. As we get many events, we can do this accurately. And we don't see any deviations. And in fact, it's the best test of strong gravity that's been made yet. Maybe more physically, I'll do a different test. And that is assume, forget Einstein for a minute, and assume that maybe these gravitational waves have connected to them a massive object, like photons, or an object that can have some mass, say, a graviton. So imagine that there's a graviton that propagates the waves. We don't have a quantum picture of all this, but, if we, but experimentally, we can test that. So if we have a mass associated with it, then the different frequencies are going to propagate at different speeds. And there's a dispersion relation. And we can then look at how much of a mass we can tolerate and fit the, the distributions that we have. And with that, on the very first event, we set the best limit that's been set so far on the mass of such an object, a graviton of 10 to the minus 22 eV over c squared. Lastly, the other great promise that we think this has is astronomy, a new kind of astronomy. And that's been the goal for, from the beginning, that basically everything we know, except a little bit with neutrinos, about our universe comes from the electromagnetic spectrum somewhere. And now we have the chance in the future, and this is the beginning, to have a new kind of astronomy where we look at the same objects or different objects with gravitational waves. Interestingly, we already see some new astrophysics with the very first event, which to me gives great confidence that this is going to be ri a rich way to do things limited by our ability to get good enough to make real measurements of gravitational waves. First, what did we see? We saw stellar binary black holes. 
and that, that exists. We directly saw them that had never been done before. More interestingly, we saw that they form binary pairs. That's new. Not only that, the binary pairs coalesce within the lifetime of our universe. So that's all very interesting. And lastly, as a surprise, these stellar black holes, these are stellar black holes, meaning that they presumably came from the collapse of a heavy star uh, initially, are very heavy. They're more than 20, mega, 20 mass, masses of the sun, each one. I show the mergers here. This is the scale. This is, uh, I cut the scale off. This is 20, this is 60, this is 20. This is the highest masses that have ever been inferred from X-ray studies. So already on the very first event, we've created an interesting issue, which is how do these very massive black holes get made? Uh, if they're made by stellar collapse, uh, that has a problem that very heavy stars aren't stable unless they're in a very special situation. So with more data and more information, we hope to unravel whether there's primordial, whether there's uh, stellar, what the situation is. And with that, uh, and the promise to do other things, I'm finished. Thank you. <laughs>